Hello, fire engineering, engineering world. Uh, this is Dan DeGrice at Hump Day uh, Hangout on Wednesday, March 31st. I got a wonderful guest today, uh, Dr. Sarah Jenke. Uh, you'll notice that typically if you've ever <laughs> seen this show before, I usually have a co-host, um, Rob Fisher uh, from uh, Italian Chief out of Snohomish, Washington. It took me a while to actually say that because it has more than two syllables, but I got it now. Um, so uh, Rob, unfortunately, will not be with us. To, the unfortunate thing, he has a, a very good friend that's battling cancer, and so he's going to be with him, uh, and we completely understand. Uh, so it'll be me and Sarah, and hopefully during the hour conversation I have with Sarah, we'll do as much laughing as if you know Sarah, we'll do <laughs> some laughing. We'll, she'll do, maybe she'll throw a couple of swear words in there and um, answer a few questions. Uh, so those of you that don't know me, my name is Dan DeGrace. I'm a retired battalion chief out of Chicago. And I get to do this about five times a year and get people, special guests like Sarah, to talk about <clears throat> the fire service, behavior health. And what's cool about her is that while we study a lot of people, a lot of things, the fire service, um, tactics, strategies, uh, we're, we're very learned uh, kind of service oriented people, uh, EMS, uh, she studies us. <laughs> so she's gonna tell us a little bit about us that some of us already know that we're a little goofy and crazy and, and uh, one thing I do know about her is she'll be honest. So if you're <laughs> if, if you're queasy, you might want to turn turn off your Facebook or stop listening to us now. But um, <laughs> well, hopefully any, it's not that bad. Oh no, it's going to be fun. Um, uh, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Jenke and, and uh, Sarah. If you can just kind of give a little little bio about yourself. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> if you're que if you are prone to be queasy during your Facebook, I'm not that bad. Uh, Sarah Jenke, I'm the director of the Center for Fire Rescue and EMS Health Research, and have been doing firefighter health research for um, about a dozen years now. Uh, started looking at things like cardiovascular risk factors and risk for injury, and then have, and some behavioral health stuff early on, and then just have really like followed what um, research questions have come up from each study. So grew up around the fire service, which is how I got into this line of work. My dad retired um, about, about the, a little bit before I, uh, before I started doing the research. So about 15 years ago, 15, almost, maybe almost 20 years ago. Um, and now so fire or has a company that does fire training towers. So he stayed involved, but yeah, started, um, started doing research and just haven't stopped it's a fun group i mean it's a i i mean it's a, it's just a really fun group to work with people ask me like why i got into this and i'm like what else like what's a better job than hanging out in a firehouse talking to people so <laughs> and i think that is why i have such foul language i don't I think I can't. I, <laughs> oh wait a second you got to take ownership on that <laughs> um i'm not gonna i'm not gonna blame your 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 dad maybe your mom no <laughs> oh no my mom was always like like we weren't even allowed to say shit when we were little like our butt she was okay. like you does or not no no i came to this late in life <laughs> you're evolving just like we all are it's I just am. like most fire service personnel we don't know what we're going to do when we grow up i guess i well, i my this was not my plan i always said i would never do research other than my dissertation so um, and then I just got into it and I really liked it. So, and I, I was going to be a child psychologist. So I started working with kids. And oh, that's pretty, I, fire service is pretty close. So see, it, yeah, same, same, but different. It wow. was, um, no, I loved working with kids, but their parents sucked. So I was, I was like, yeah, I gotta go. Well, it, interesting things. I didn't know that. So when I started my career in uh, behavioral health, I started working with adolescents, 13 to 18. Oh, back in, nice. Probably before you were born, 1986. <clears throat> oh, I wish that was before I was born. Thank you. Um, I love you even more now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Frank Lito, who? And uh, <laughs> so when we worked with the kids, what we found out after they kind of stabilized, 
uh, being in the program for about a week or so, when we met the parents, I'm like, now I know why he or she is like that. So you're totally. absolutely right. And totally. so why we could get the behavior to change for the individual, we couldn't, would they, they got worse towards the end of treatment because they knew they were going to go back to their, yeah. their dysfunctional yeah. family. Yeah. No, I mean, which totally makes sense. And I also love about kids that like, they're pretty bare, you know, like they'll walk in and like, I had one kid walk out. Well, I can't say that. Um, it's inappropriate language, but he, <laughs> well, I'll tell you, he said, um, you can, it, Peter can bleep it out if we need to. This little kid walks in, he's like five years old. He walks in, he goes, well, I'm the whore and she's going to hell. And I was like, I think I know what the problem is. <laughs> And it's not so, your mom. It's the fact that you're five and you've heard that. So, so what's yeah. funny is that, um, I, so Peter can't bleep it out because we're live. Oh, <laughs> but I, I, wanted, I, I was so interested and everybody else that's going to listen wanted to hear it anyways because <laughs> they know you. That's why they're listening. Sorry. So that's perfect. <laughs> Anyhow, well. so, um, so that's interesting. So my first question really is, that so you became you're, you're a doctor i want to ask you first did your dad want you to be in the fire service or did you want to be a firefighter it's funny because i've been asked that before and my initial reaction and it stayed the same as <laughs> and which and i do a lot of studying of women in the fire service now and um i think they're like why did i never think of that and i just think as like a, a family member of someone, like I saw how much it took for my dad to do that role. But I always thought, I don't, you know, we just always had to be, especially, I mean, my memories of him are just pretty much as a, once he was the chief and like one, the amount of stress that I know it put on him. Um, but then just like, you know, without fail, like Christmas, Thanksgiving dinner, something always happened, you know? And like, I'm in Kansas, so tornadoes, like he was always out. Um, and I just thought, I, I don't think I thought it, but in hindsight, when I say, why did I never consider that? I'm like, I just wouldn't, I didn't want that for my career. Now I say that and I travel all the time for work and stuff like that. But I think I was just uh, going to say that I go, <laughs> I know, I, <laughs> but like I can plan for that. Like the unexpectedness sure. of being in the fire service, I think was not that attractive. To me and I wondered like is it just because I didn't see women in the fire service and but I don't think that was it because actually dad had a, one of um hired early on a woman that he was always like she was one of the best firefighters I ever hired so I don't think it was that I think it was just the unexpectedness of always having to be gone I don't know I'm gonna have to dig into so that so the, the good thing is the good so the good thing is it, we didn't lose you from the fire service you are studying us which is great yeah. so better late than never yeah. <clears throat> so you are a doctor and uh so it's cool to hear that you wanted to be a clinical psychologist but so what is your title and what are you wh what's your degree in so my i have a phd in psychology um, and I did the health emphasis. So I studied a lot of like health behaviors, did a lot of substance um, use type stuff early on, especially like tobacco, did a lot on tobacco when I was in grad school. Um, and then once I got out, I kind of, be, because my plan was to be a, a child psychologist and that obviously failed, um, I decided to kind of expand. So I started really getting into the world of epidemiology and, and looking at, you know, health risk behaviors and, and, and health behaviors and how that played into everything. So got involved in some research on things like fitness and nutrition and a little bit, you know, kind of like a broader um, spectrum have published several on, uh, articles on epi stuff and like risk for injury and that kind of thing. So a little bit different. And then also have done some studies on behavioral health too, which is which is cool because it's you know, kind of where it came from. So what I've learned yeah. about you is, is you like numbers. I you're, you're, like you're, numbers. you're kind of, uh, <laughs> as you said this, I could repeat it. You're a geek Total. with numbers. And Total. what's, what's cool is the other person I work with at the IFF is, um, Sarah Burns and she loves numbers. I think you probably know her. Um, they're just, 
there's always a study for that, or there should be a study for whatever it is. <laughs> but what you, may, what you may have to explain is epidemiology. Yeah. Yeah. So like the study of um, epidemics, you know, so that's where like people have started to hear about epidemiologists, which before everyone always thought it was just um, skin, you know, studying skin for the epi because of the epidermis. But epidemiology is just the study of epidemics. But you can, I mean, it, it's broadly defined epidemics can be all sorts of different things. So looking at um, kind of basically trends, you know, population level trends of things and, and what you, are things improving? Are they not improving those sorts of things? So, yeah. So let's talk about that is that, um... I'm going to throw a couple of things at you, but I kind of want to know what your passion is per se, the, er, the specific area, and then what you're seeing the trend being is that I, so I've done behavioral health for 35 years. And again, working with adolescents is different than working with children, which I've worked as young as seven years old, which is very trying, um, very difficult because of the, the parents, and uh, very sad sometimes, but um, now working with adults and specifically, typically the population or the, the, the career as first responders, that's where my passion truly is, is to help people on a journey to a better quality of life per se. And a um, lot, of, lot of cool people in the fire service, a lot of skilled people in the fire service, a lot of resilient people in the fire service and EMS. And when I say fire service, <clears throat> I'm talking about fire and EMS, a lot of capable, smart millionaires. Um, but we, what we've learned, what I've learned is that there's a cumulative effect of the stress and the effects on our systems, our 14 different systems that we don't usually identify until about maybe halfway uh, through our career. Um, because of the cumulative effect. And that's, that's me. My, that's my semi-educated, uneducated personal experience is that me running the flooring program at, and, and Rosecrans, the average uh, age of the person that we see that comes through here is around 43 to 45. And the years of experience is typically 15 to 30 years. Uh, when I did a study in Chicago about suicide, when I didn't know it was an issue in the fire service or in the country, the average age of death was 54. And I'm like, son of a gun. Because uh, 54, you're thinking you should be in your golden years, retirement, looking forward to life and family as opposed to taking your life. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 where's your passion? What, what do you, where do you, where's Sarah gone? It depends on the, the day and the moment you ask me because there's so many things that I find interesting. I mean, like overall, I think my passion is just like, I, I have so much respect for the folks I know in the fire service. And, you know, I, just growing up around it, I think I, I grew up believing that it was a great group of people and, you know, that they're all trying to do the best they can. And I think my passion is like, I want those people to live as long as possible. Really. And really, I do think it kind of goes back to like, I, my dad's had a couple of heart attacks. He's had cancer. Um, I think I don't want other people's kids to have to go through that. Like, and I don't want, I, I don't think I realized appreciated to your point about like being 55. I didn't know. I don't know that I appreciated the mental health impact that being the fire service and kind of like that constantly on call stress of being a chief in the fire service had on my dad until he left that. Um, and I saw like a change in him in terms of the way he reacted. And I think, so I, I, I mean, like my overarching, like big picture passion is just like, I want people to live long and happy lives. I want them to be as healthy as possible for as long as possible. I want to avoid them having cancer, I want to avoid the, their um, their um, their kids having to sit through their heart surgeries, that kind of stuff. Um, I, it's like all of that. I think I, I want that's my big picture passion. Like, what can we do to make life better? I I recently, well, I, yesterday, I was at a funeral for someone who passed away from cancer, and there are moments that you know you like get down, and you're like, man, is anything like it makes you reevaluate your life and all that kind of stuff. And 
I was doing that and I had a moment of like, I don't know, like, is, is my life, like, am I doing what I should? Am I, you know, kind of reevaluating? And I thought, you know what, like the work I can see in a lot of ways, like the work I do, because I'm doing some stuff on cancer, but I see like, I really think my passion is trying to get people to have help, help, healthier, happier lives. I mean, and it, it's cut, like gone in a lot of different directions in terms of like what that, what that is research wise, like we're doing some stuff on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and looking at like mental health as an impact of, as a result of discrimination and harassment. Um, there's a lot of conversation to, about like leadership in the fire service and the stress of that role. I think there's one of the really cool areas. I mean, the cool, well, and that, this, this is my problem is I'll say like a really cool area that we could study is, and then it's something really depressing. But I do think like looking at people when they leave the fire service, especially people that are like separated from service earlier for some sort of like disability, that I think that what is so awesome and protective about fire service is like you're it, it is like being part of a family when it when it works the way it's supposed to work, right? And so that's like the people you go to for support. It's where so much a part of identity is being in the fire service, like you're anywhere in the country. I mean, you, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Like you go to anywhere and you're like, oh, I'm a, um, I'm a battalion chief in Chicago. And all of a sudden it's like, okay, so they know like where you are at rank wise, they know the department, they know, you know, so it's like, there's a certain amount of like, you could walk into a fire station anywhere in the world and they're all like, oh, okay. But then like, once that's gone, of course, I'm not at all surprised that people struggle with that when they go. Look who it is. Uh, hello, hello. The Mr. Bobby Halton. Speaking of people who struggle, I struggle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I wasn't going to say it, but. <laughs> and that wasn't, that wasn't even planned. That was totally by accident, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bobby, Bernard, welcome. You think people are talking about you? Always. <laughs> uh, always, right? It's whether or not we uh, actually hear what they're saying. Um, my, obviously, you know, Sarah, and she's, she only, so we've been on for 20 minutes. So she's got one swear word per 10 minutes. So I'm allowing her four more. Uh, so if, we, if, if, <laughs> if, mark that down. if she gets thrown off or I get thrown off, um, so be it. I had a good time. Um, I, I, my question to, to Sarah was, What's her passion? Um, I think we know she's done research. She grew up in a family. Uh, her, her father was in a fire service. She saw the, the stress on him, the missed uh, family events, uh, the long nights, the, the tiredness. I mean, we could do a whole talk on sleep, right, as we're learning about this. And I've been retired now 15 months. And actually, I've had one night where I've slept through the night more than uh, four hours. So I think I had one, one night of six hours, but when we talk about, uh, you know, identity and then longevity, there's two things I want to offer you and see if you know any more is that when I looked at suicide rate in Chicago, mm -hmm. I also looked at longevity. So in the nineties, the average life expectancy after retirement for a Chicago firefighter, you know, I'd looked at, um, 8,000 people and, and I think 2000 or more deaths uh, was four years and that's not good. And then the next 10 years was I think 11 years, which was better. But if you look at some people that spend, and I'm assuming Bobby, Bobby, you've, you, you've dedicated 35 plus years and more now with fire engineering. That's not stressful at all. I, I, you know, I don't know why you would complain at all, but um you know, what does retirement look like then with the, in one of the comments uh, from Facebook was family along with work trauma can either make or break your emotional well-being. And, and that is absolutely so true. So uh, it, it's so cool to have partners like Sarah to be able to study us. But then it's like, okay, what's the trajectory? Where do we go from here and you're getting pulled in a lot of different directions, Sarah, just like Bobby is. And I left one full-time job and I'm still staying in my career. So where, what's, what's 
where where is things pulling you and your your energies? You know, I think um, God, that's a great question. I think well, I th- a couple of things. I think one thing that I am appreciating looking at is like, and I always think of this when I talk to Bobby too, is like the what is working well, like the resilience. What like why are more people that deal with the stress not like in the fetal position in the corner like it because it is stressful right like it's it's a stressful job you show up to everyone's worst day well if you then, did if you did in a firehouse they'd kick you and tell you to get up but i know bobby's done that a few times a few people but, but go on but there's something really good about that right <laughs> like there's something that like there's so much about the fire service that pulls for resilience. And that's what I think. So we're working on a study on, we're looking at um, reproductive health and uh, and females and epigenetic changes, pre and post fire exposure. But we're also looking, we're developing this, um, I know, right? Interesting. We're also looking at um, how we can build like a, a tool for to help build resilience for women in the fire service. Because we know that if you look at, we just did a study where we looked at low, medium, and high levels of discrimination and harassment. The women who experienced high levels of discrimination and harassment had way worse outcomes, obviously, on behavioral health. Like, that's not a shocker, right? But they were more um, in, it, they were like three times the, the um, rate of depression, of, um, of post-traumatic stress symptoms, higher rates of injury, higher rates of lost duty days, higher rates of um, concerning substance use. So like, but like but no duh, right? Like we were able to quantify it. It, it didn't take the researcher to tell you like that's bad. If you bring people into the fire department or a fire station and you treat them really shitty, they're not going to do well, which I think actually, and we have another set of data that we're just analyzing about men and the fire service. And I think you're going to say the, see the same thing. Like if you bring, like there's always a couple people that are always like the joking is so beneficial, but sometimes if people go too far, so it's like, okay, how do you know if you are going too far? Because it does have a negative effect. And what can we quantify that? So basically the impact, but back to the original point about the study. So what we're going to do though, is look at um, one of the firefighters out in San Francisco, coined it. she goes, it's like you're creating a virtual kitchen table. So for those women who really are feeling good, and I get it too, like I mentioned, I think that fire service is like, I think they're, they're good people trying to do good things. I don't think for the most part, people aren't like, I'm going to treat someone really shitty. Like sometimes that happens, but I think it's pretty rare. But I think a lot of times, like, especially with women, like you bring women into the fire service and it's like, oh, like, I don't want to offend, so I'm not going to say anything, but I don't want to like like we're kind of all living together like a family, but I want to be careful about how I treat. So then, but it ends up being that a lot of times people don't feel like they have the support they need. So, so this San Francisco firefighters, like you're like creating a virtual kitchen table for the, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, because the idea is like, how can we take what we know works so well about the fire service? And there is so much that works really well on the behavioral health front in the fire service. How can we make sure that everyone has access? to that and some you know some of the camaraderie comes around like specific calls or you know kind of like those informal debriefings so maybe that's not going to be there but like if someone's um struggling with fertility because we know that if well we know that there are fertility issues for men in the fire service but like women we just calculated like about a doubling of risk for miscarriage and so like you have someone struggling with that like is there another firefighter that you know, can, can help you out with that. They can talk to you about how they handled something and how can you like create that resource? So for really from like a strength based perspective, how do you create that for people who may not have it at their kitchen table? And then like, once we expand beyond, like this is a, how are we going to do this? Which I don't know, that's a research question, but then there are all sorts of other people in the fire service, right. Who might be struggling with that same thing. So how can you like build resilience for the organization and, and for firefighters who might not, you know, who might be missing out out with their crew, but do that more widely. I don't know. So that's, yeah. No, that's that's good. And this is where I'm going to bring in Bobby. And we've had this discussion before. Um, And I'm just going to touch on the fact that you mentioned about say bullying or, or being treated 
poorly at times. I've had some discussions with some female uh, females in the fire service, and they talk about discrimination and bullying. And I'll say, please tell me about that. And I'll the, the, some of them will be surprised. They said, well, that happened to me, and that happened to me, and that happened to me. And you just said you just had a study. And unfortunately, that has been a, a fabric for a long time, not by everybody, but by some, that this is where we lead into, say, a culture. And what is a culture? And what I've learned from talking with Bobby is a culture isn't a mythical thing. The culture is people and leaders and barn bosses and senior people and ranking officers. And it's a tangible thing that unfortunately from a behavioralistic standpoint, they're only as good as what they, who they are and what they've been taught. And what we need to do, what you are doing, what Bobby does and what Bobby does in the leadership. And I think that's why people are asking you about leadership. And I, I don't look at myself as a leader. I, I, for many years, I, I, I'll be honest, as I've been a follower, and that's how I grew up in a, a family atmosphere as a, uh, as a son of an alcoholic, as I followed his direction until I changed that pattern and wanted to break that pattern. And that's kind of what I see in the fire service is that we have had some really great leaders, but we also have some that have not had the best guidance and we need people. Yeah, Bobby's probably thinking of. So this is, so Bobby um, and then Sarah, please, uh, on this topic of leadership and uh, we don't need to change everything. What do we need to do? I, I think we need to go back to first principles. Um, uh, mercy, grace, forgiveness, um, all of those things and get away from retribution, guilt, um, culpability, uh, things that people uh, can't control. You can control mercy and grace. And, and so those are first principles, right? And on that, you know, you can go into integrity and things of that nature, you know, but the, the, the problem becomes twofold. First, I love the fact that you brought up Walker's book, Why We Sleep. It's a great book. I think everybody should read it. Phenomenal book, right? And oddly, Dan, to your issue about getting up once, I get up four or five times, buddy. And I've been doing that for about 20 years. So get ready. <laughs> but mine is generally biologically oriented not really anything to do with my, my different reasons i get it and that was a, that was only one time it, typically it's four or five but i, I didn't want to be a topper <laughs> but that does disrupt your sleep right and that's something yes. that that's a male issue and it's a it's a continence issue our bladder has become <laughs> affected for various reasons and and uh you know all kinds of health issues can, can make that happen to men. And so our sleep patterns do get disrupted. And we know that it starts to occur, grossly speaking, at about age 50 for men. And, and it accelerates from there. But we still have men in their 50s and 60s working as firefighters. So it's something to keep in, in our back of our minds when we're talking about wellness. As to leadership, Dan, I think that... Um, that there's so many programs out there and they tell you, oh, you need to, I once met Stephen Covey, wonderful man, lousy instructor, worst instructor I've ever met in my entire life, but great fella, just that, and, and he'll be the first guy to tell you, he's not a teacher, he's a writer, he's a thinker, and he had just done the eighth habit. So I asked him, I said, Stephen, I said, how many folks do you know who are, who, you know, uh, are, are highly effective leaders? He said, oh, none, zero. And, and I laughed and he goes, yeah, that's why I wrote, so, that's why I sold so many books. He said, you know, the idea of the eight uh, habits are that Sarah might be great at five of them. You know, Dan might be great at three or four of them. I might Wait be a second. At, well, come on now. I might be great at one or two. <laughs> but right. But so we all have things we can work on and we all have things that we're good at. And one of the greatest concepts to come out of modern linguistic stuff is when Stan McChrystal came up with the team of teams uh, nomenclature, which has been done um, without a label throughout history, right? I mean, uh, and, and that's really where you'll see the best 
organizations, period. Because the people closest to the work at the tip of the spear with skin in the game generally know what they're doing and they know how to treat one another. But now we've got, and no disrespect to people with PhDs and EEXS, you know, I, I, as, as Ray McCormick has said, I have a GFO, you know, very, very well sought after degree, ghetto fire officer. So it's, uh, you learn a lot, right? Um, another buddy of mine once said he, he had a PhD and I said, really? I said, yeah, public high school diploma. And I was like, that's perfect. So I don't have, so, so I think that with the team of teams, right now there's a whole group of elitists who are trying to teach us how to find a fence where none exists. And when we break away from those elite people who have no skin in the game, who are, who are just trying to gain power and control, and we go back to, we, Sarah and I talk a lot and, and we've had some hysterical conversations, which I won't bring up because she'd kill me, but, but we have. And Thank you. Right. But I mean, but that's the kind of thing, right? That, that's the kind of thing we have to get to rather than trying to psychoanalyze people or, you know, um, break people down or put people into groups and categories. How about you show a little mercy and treat people like people? How about you show a little grace and accept that, okay, maybe they don't see the world that you do and that's okay. And it's okay to make fun of one another and have a good time with one another. But there's a line, you know, when you hurt them or they say, oh, that was a little too close, back off and say, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? And then they'll generally say, yeah, but you're right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jump on that, Bobby, just for a second before Sarah answers, is that when I went through uh, the academy for my five weeks to become a battalion chief, um, they were telling us, you got to you got to do this. You got to do that. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to be set the table. You got to manage everything. And I'm thinking, and I was, I covered downtown Chicago. As you know, it's a small town in Illinois and trying to get from one side to the next and trying to manage all that. You go bananas and trying to traverse traffic. But I remember having a water rescue and I have this uh, uh, officer. He was a lieutenant. Now he's a captain. Um, he's a fire chief in another department. And he looked at me, his name is Brandon um, Dyer, former Marine, super guy. He's like, hey, chief, can I tell you something? I said, absolutely. I would be aggravated if you didn't. What that told me right there is that previous people didn't want to accept his information. And so we had a conversation after that. And I said, listen, I am not a rescue diver. I am not a guy that jumps out of helicopters. I may want to, but I just haven't had, I, did, I don't have that skill set. I said, when I get on a scene of a, of a high rise, of, a, of, a, of a, a motor vehicle accident, of a mass casualty incident, of a, 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 a jumper from the 45th story of the, the Hancock building or whatever it is, I said, I need your expertise. I need you to tell me what you see because I am, and Sarah will appreciate, impotent in the, in the sense of my, yeah, I did say that. It was, I don't think it's a bad word. Um, well, it was a fertility conversation earlier. Yeah, exactly. So that um, you need eyes on the scene. I'm looking at a, a lake that I don't know how big it is. I, I, I need I need 100 eyes out there. So we had a conversation and I said, Brandon, first into my zone. If you got if you see something, you need to tell me something. And we had a great relationship after that. Um, Sarah? Well, and I, like, I think that is what this is all, like, in some ways it seems so simple, but I think that's what this all comes back around to, you know, and it's not, um, I, because I don't think people are, I just don't think most people are just like shitty people trying to be nasty. And I think, I think most people in the fire service, like it's a great group of people who want to do the right thing. Three. That um, <laughs> your 10 minutes was over. So that's your third for work. Go ahead. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> but no, but I mean, that's like, it's back to the basics, right? That most people, and I think. Hey, this, to, this is cable. Let it go. <laughs> <laughs> and I, still, I still have the swear jar on my desk. We, we, uh, we, have, an, we have an over under right now. It's over. 
over yeah. it's six is the the middle that's a break even under six over six so i what do we have to put in the square square jar because i'll just venmo you right now if i because <laughs> i yeah because i'll be over whatever number it is that you i had someone actually tally it one time during the presentation i was like oh damn i should watch that um but I, I it, yeah, no. Just to add, Sarah, the only reason I have it, it's Saul on the road to Damascus. There was a point in my life where I was an absolute, I made sailors blush. And I hurt myself and I hurt other people with bad words. And so I, I it was like a great lesson. It was like Saul on the road to Damascus. Because one day a guy said something to me from his heart. And, and I was mm -hmm. like, oh my gosh. And I realized, yeah, I shouldn't use those words anymore. Yeah, so, I, I, like, there's a couple you really should never use. Yes, I, I, yeah, she already I used it. She used you. epidemiology. <laughs> <laughs> I can think of a few I will definitely never use. I, I, um, yeah, I, well, I have little kids around now that are always go, Aunt Sarah, Aunt Sarah, and I'm like, oh. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm working on it, but um, it's a very slow work in process. Uh, no, but back to like what we were talking about though, that I think that it's, um, it is back to the basics in a lot of ways. And I think we're able to put data behind it to convince people sometimes, but I don't know that it's the data that's gonna make any difference. You know, I, I think it's gonna be the conversations around like this matters and this does impact. I, did, I know I didn't use another curse word, so. <laughs> But Dan and Sarah, uh, th we have a question that I, I'd like you to address. Do you see that up in the chat? So, yes. but, but other than that, is there really anything else but the basics? I mean, all the all the advanced are are just more and more basics, kind of stacked atop one another. You know what I mean? Uh, but you know, especially in your field, Sarah and Dan's, it all comes down to listening, hearing. Um, empathizing, you know, commiserating. I mean, you guys deal with people who are, you know, you, you both professionally deal with people who are looking for support and help. And when people you learn, you learn this in the academy and so did everybody else and people don't get it is that think about the time that everybody put that SCBA in for the first time. And think about the time that you walk through the smoke tower or the confidence course and um, from the, the probie to the instructor. And what did the probie typically do? They lost uh, a sense of their surroundings. They lost their senses, their sight. Uh, even though they were touching things, they weren't exactly sure what they were touching. Their breathing, um, their thinking, all got confused because of what they were being exposed to. And so, from a recovery standpoint and from a treatment standpoint, it's really breaking down the basics. And I, we often, and Sarah knows this from talking to so many different people is, tell me what you're thinking, because I can't see what you're thinking. I can see behavior, but you could be doing something that's completely uh, different than what you're thinking. Many people that are depressed behave in a outwardly open way people that are suicidal right don't tell you that they're suicidal because they don't know for many different reasons i won't get go down that rabbit hole but what we have to do just as we do as instructors as individuals is i was taught this by a battalion chief downtown chicago he said you need to know three things as a as a chief especially downtown chicago number one slow to f down number two slow the F down. And number three, and most importantly, slow the F down. Once you do that, you come in within yourself and you start to think better. You start to see things better. And what do we do when we tell people when they're breathing too hard in a confidence course? Slow to F down. Slow your breathing down so you have an understanding of what's going on. The question out here is in regards to... Um, uh, you know, one up people, each other with uh, who has the most trauma. Yeah, well, I, if you did this, I did this. If you did this, my fire was bigger. If you had, 
three deaths, I, I saw four. If somebody had two knives sticking out of their chest, I saw somebody with six. And um, we wanted, we didn't get into the fire service to sit behind a desk and do nothing. We want to do stuff. Sarah wants to do research. You are bored to death when you don't have people to talk to in numbers. Um, but th- some of us are skilled at being able to traverse that and others get affected negatively by it, just like we've seen in the confidence course. So Sarah, with that question, with that, what I want you to also answer for all of us out here that are, have been in the fire, getting in a fire service or in the fire service or retired from the service, did we pick the wrong career? I mean, no, not if it's something that you love, right? But I think to add on to what Bobby said, I think you're absolutely right about those basics. The one thing that I would add is that people have to start talking about it. They've start, got to start using their voice when they need to, because I think, you know, like you talk about everyone, you know, knows the right thing and it's grace, but like, like the question, like what, and yes, absolutely. I think sometimes the dark humor, I think it can absolutely be helpful. I think it can sometimes go beyond, but like say, you know, if you're bothered by it, like, let's just be real with each other. Like it's supposed to be like a family. If you're struggling with something, or if you hear one of our big things right now is like bystander intervention, which sounds really stupid, but we know that a lot of times everyone's standing around going like that crossed the line or that's not helpful, but everyone's afraid to say something because they don't want to be the, you know, that one person in the room that, but I think once you start realizing that like everyone in the room is thinking the same thing, like this has gone too far or this is, you know, this is, this is not helpful at this point or you're treating so like, I, I, because I think it is so much about having grace. I love that. That's my word for the year actually is, is grace. It, partly grace with other people, especially in 2021, but also grace with myself. Like, I'm um, sometimes like, I just gotta, this is, I, I, this is too much. I need a minute. And, um, but I think being able to like, say, not being afraid to look weak or not being able to like, or like, you don't want to be that one person, but when you realize like everyone in the room is that one person and then one person says it and everyone's like, Oh yeah, I was thinking that, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm describing it well, but I just think it. Um, if, you're, if you're thinking it, saying it, say it right. Because the yeah. chances of somebody else thinking it is pretty good. Pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> and like, and in that conversation where like the dark humor, I mean, I think at some point, yeah, I do think that it can be, I think it can have an effect and probably if it's having an effect on you, it's probably having that same effect on everyone else. And I mean, if someone were to say like, wow, this is, you know, and if people are at some point, like, you know, this is, is being a therapist, but at some point, if people are like joking about stuff to a point that you're like, you maybe did cross out, you know, usually there's something behind it. You know, if someone's really trying to one up you on stuff, usually there's some, something's going on, you know, they're needing to talk about something. And so I think, and even like with all the behavior hall, and like, I feel like we get all this research and we do all these programs, we measure all these things. And really, like Bobby said, it comes back to like, I think the most important thing on the behavioral health side is like being able to pay attention and seeing when someone is struggling and then being willing to say something about it, you know, like, on any of these fronts, just being able and willing to use your voice. And like, it does take a whole nother level of trust to trust that you can say something without everyone, you know, being angry or, or that, you know, fear that they're going to think badly about you or anything like that. I don't know. I feel like I didn't describe that well. Bobby probably can do that. <laughs> Bobby, before we get to you, we should have a little thing here that raises your hand. Um, cause you, you're actually really doing it, raising your hand, which is really like cool. That. Yeah. I like that. Um, he's being very proper. I don't know if that's because we're not live or because you're here, Sarah, or maybe it Peter cannot be me. So before we get to your thing, Bobby, um, one question for each of you in a, in a short answer, kind of what you were just saying is, 
If you could say one thing to the leadership, Sarah, right now, what would you say? Or what have you I, held back? Well, I don't know. What I, I, I'm not very good at holding things back. I think it. I think what I would say would be like to listen to, I, I, well, I'm going to steal Bobby's piece about having grace, but um, to listen and then to not be afraid to speak up, like on all fronts. Bobby? Yeah. I think that's a fascinating thing that Sarah just said, and I'll just dovetail a little bit there and then tell you what I think. A, a, a great writer that I admire a great deal, his name is Douglas Murray. I don't agree with all of his thoughts, but he's, he's brilliant. The other day he gave an interview where he talked about courage and it reminded me of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. When Solzhenitsyn first came out, it was back in the early 70s. And you have to remember that the postmodernist Dear Day and Foucault and all those people in, in Europe were huge. And it was the end of the Vietnam War and people were all talking about communism and socialism being so great, you know, because they were allying with the, the, the uh, North Vietnam, the, North Vietnamese government and, and the communists that were coming down and then and how wonderful it was. Well, and Socialism got out of Russia, had, wrote the Gulag Archipelago, the bureaucrat, other books, and suddenly everybody realized, well, actually, no, that's a horrible, horrible, despotic, tyrannical form of government that just destroys people. And so he once said, never allow, the way that those socialists, communists, it's all the same thing. They just like to use socialists because it sounds softer, but the way they gain power is by forcing people to say things that they know are not true, to deny fundamental truths. And so what Sarah just said is so important. Never allow anyone to make you say anything that's not true. Um, and, and we're doing that to people, right? You know, we're, we're making people feel culpable for things that they had no control over. And oftentimes as a leader, you know, you get held culpable for things that you had no control over. And so as a, my advice to leaders would be to never allow anyone to force you to say anything that's not true. And if you want to get the research behind it, I would read Alexander Solzhenitsyn and, and I would read, you know, the bureaucrat. I would read, you know, Gulag Archipelago or at least read what he, his, his inspiration behind it. Um, cause, cause that voice, he, his voice is going to be almost like the Thomas Paine of our day. And when it comes to, mental health, I think there were so many really beautiful things that were said here. And Dan, there's no real time constraint here. I know always people worry about, oh, we're at the hour. You're not at an hour. So feel free for you two to go over because I think you're two of the most important voices in the fire service right now in terms of this topic in particular, because I think you're the most thoughtful and, 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 and the least self-aggrandizing, which I think is really, really important. But I would, I would say Dan said some really important things about life in general with his analogy of the, of the confidence course is that in life, we need anchors. We need to know where we are. Uncertainty uh, is so terrifying, right? In, in most regards and orientation, those anchors orient us, right? Whether it's a partner, whether it's the skills, whether it's, you know, whatever. And so it's the same thing in life. And when we lose those anchors and we lose that orientation and we feel adrift, you know, you guys know that those people go into crisis then. So I think for leaders, I would say always try to, and history helps us to do that for me in particular, but tradition, history helps us stay anchored to something, right? So I think with your, even if you're going to put, before you put somebody through a confidence course, you know, just take it to Dan's analogy. If you probably say to them, listen, these are going to happen to you, or we're going to teach you that historically the first time is a little scary. The second time is less scary. The fourth time, like I practiced making love alone a lot and I got really good at it till the first time I had a partner and then it just all fell apart. But that's another story for another time. But that, you know, so the other thing about, uh, I think what you said, which is so brilliant is that there are chronic things and then there are acute things, right? And sometimes people will go through things in life that happen incrementally and we see it, right? And then sometimes things happen that are sudden. It's the same thing like medical. You know, people might get heart disease and struggle and work with it for years. And then some other poor person 
just drops like third period French. Nobody saw it coming. Um, so I, I think that what you guys do is so, so critical. And the conversation is so, so critical, right? Because um, how, and I always tell people, be careful. Talk to people like Dan, talk to people like Sarah. There's others that are, are working in this field who have studied it deeply, who care about it, who do it for a living. It, you, you know, I think that there's nothing more um, fragile than our mental health. And, um, and it's not something we should trifle with, right? Um, or, or take lightly because it, it is so important. But anchors to me and orientation to me, that's what, a, if, you, if you want to talk about doing something in leadership, and you don't need to be the chief of the department. You could be, the, the, you could be a, just an older firefighter and you can go up to the kid in training and say, man, the first time I did this, holy mackerel, halfway through, I pulled my mask off and I was, but the second time I got three quarters of the way through before I pulled my mask off and said, you know, the, the last time I got all the way through. And, you know, it, 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 so I think that Dan's are, it's the same thing in life. You know, we, we get to point that the, the, in judges, if you, if you look at judges in the Bible, there was a, the last judge was a, um, not Solomon, uh, Samuel. And Samuel once said that, the more certain you are about something, the more likely you know absolutely nothing about it. <laughs> so, well, that's that's, uh, that's my Bobby, that, that's great. I'm one. I'm glad that you got some something out of what I said because when you got Sarah, who is a PhD, there she got a lot better things, and she actually uh, we talked about it. She uh, showered, did her hair, got some makeup on today. We talked about that. That's not normal. For her, so uh, I don't know. I think she heard that she was going to get paid for this, right, Bobby? Oh no, <laughs> okay. Sorry, Sarah. That I'll get you lunch sometime. Um, <laughs> she's having a senior moment. Two things, and then I and and give it back to Sarah. Is that uh, you? Great points. If we know in the research world is that if you have information on the expectations, you'll probably have a better outcome. What we have a tendency to do too in the fire service is test people and test people to a fault, which could be identified as bullying, which we do as well. And we still do. We've always done. One of the responses to the traumas that we've experienced and the, uh, whether it be bullying or uh, exhaustion or the, the, the visions and the thoughts that we've experienced is dark humor. Uh, one of the other things that we do, and sorry, Sarah, I'm gonna th throw this out there, is that we use language um, sometimes poorly. And many times what I'll ask people, and, I, and I'm, I'm at fault at, at, as it will, is when I hear every third word, and it's not you, Sarah, when I hear every third word as a, maybe every fourth word, uh, a swear word, I, I'm like, I'll ask people, hey, did you know you just swore like 30 times? Like, no, I didn't. It becomes a pattern. And we know from research too, that you become a product of your environment. The, the fire service has great leaders and leaderships. And Bob, you mentioned a bunch of books that and, and authors I can't even spell or remember because, you know, I don't read books because I have a brain that doesn't comprehend that piece of it. That's why I don't have PhD after my name. I, I do have a public high school diploma though. Um, the other big piece is a thing that we all develop and that's called self-efficacy. We all have that. We all have that ability for many different reasons. And we don't know what we don't know. If we don't, like if it gets cold out, the, the, the people in Houston that just went through the freezing temperatures, they weren't looking for it and they didn't know they could get through it until they have now. Now they know they can, but they're gonna do probably better the next time, hopefully. That's no different than every fire, every water rescue, every incident that the fire service has ever experienced. But what we need to do from a leadership standpoint, and this is why it's so cool, a guy like you, Bob, to allow us to talk about behavioral health, because this is all about behavioral health. You know, uh, feelings and thoughts lead to behaviors. It's not typically the other way around. So what 
how are we leading? It comes down to leadership. And whenever I've had a class, I always kind of looked at somebody and go, who the heck is this person? As I know that when I walk in a room, people are like, who the heck is this guy? And they're probably going, well, he's, he's, a, Bob, he's a Billy Bob Thornton look alike. Did, did you catch that? Yeah, you did a little bit. Okay. I'm going to stop there and let Sarah talk because she's under the six swear words. I got to get her over. <laughs> I got to get you over the limit. Uh, but I think you may, like, even you're joking about, like, not having a PhD. I think, like, there's benefit for me to have a PhD. Like, there's some stuff. But there's, and I think this is a perfect example. Like, yeah, I have a PhD, but I don't have any of the experience that you have on the stuff that you do. And like, I think that I can contribute something to the conversation, but then you contribute something to the conversation because you have all this other. And I think that's like the perfect example of what we see in the fire service. You know, I have not read the books that Bobby is talking about, but he can talk about them in a way that is interesting and understand, you know, like, I just think that, I think that's the benefit of and I think that's the benefit of the fire service and being able to like bring more people in and having more conversations about things. And, you know, we've been really like looking at diversity in the fire service and the, a lot of conversation around creating diversity, but then it's like, okay, so we had to start with like, is there benefit? And I believe now that I've looked, looked at from different angles, that there is a benefit. Um, but I think we have to value what each person brings and not assume that everyone is bringing the exact same, you know, the exact same piece. And so, like, yeah, I can spout off, you know, the increased risk of, of miscarriage and, and, um, and say, talk about the work that's being done in sperm epigenetics just to make everyone uncomfortable. But it's a different, you know, I mean, like, that's not going to fight a fire. <laughs> when there's a water rescue, you don't want me going, like, let's talk about, <laughs> you know, let me tell you about some p-values. No one cares at that point. But I think that's like the fire side. I think it's a perfect example of fire service in general, right? Like you, everyone brings their own piece to it and everyone brings a different piece. And that's why it works so beautifully when it's working beautifully, you know? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll be honest, is that a um, hundred years ago, we didn't know what we know today in regards to that smoke was going to cause cancer, that uh, smoking inside a building that was smoky was not good uh, and will kill you. And that's where then you won't have a lot of years in retirement, even if you get to retirement. Uh, learning about our gear and all that different stuff, unless somebody studies it, right? We can guess, but we need data. And that's why it's so cool to have, and I mean this sincerely, is that, um, uh, give an example is that so when we in the Chicago Fire Department had 11 of our members die by suicide in a two and a half year period, I, and I was the EAP for the Chicago Firefighters Union, I was like, what the hell? Now, I had 25 years in behavioral health, and I do nothing other than the fact that my dad was suicidal uh, several times. He never completed it, but at the end of his life, he was uh, about six years consistently thinking about dying by suicide for many different reasons. Um, if we don't have people like you to, to, to study us in this, what is the next generation of firefighters to, to, to expect? And so like when the, we had those suicides, I called the Illinois Suicide Prevention Alliance and they had 50 members on their team and not one firefighter. So I called the chairman and I say, tell me what you know. Well, they started that committee 12 years before that, and they were still just developing that. And I said, uh, you know, you have police officers, nurses, teachers, PhDs. I said, you don't have any EMS or fire people on that. They go, why do you ask? And I told them. And they're like, well, would you be on my committee? I'm like, no, I, I, I'm calling you for help uh, to, to understand why these people are dying by suicide. And then you're asking me to be on a committee. I, that's not my goal. Uh, but later on they did get somebody on the committee but we need people like you sarah we need clinicians that understand the culture and how many people that i see or, or have come to our program and said yeah i talked to three clinicians and i had to explain to them my sleep pattern why i couldn't make iop 
uh, my, my, my shift schedule, all that stuff, you know, these things. So what, what, what is Sarah and her group? So number one, where, where do people reach out to you? And you're going to be like, no, you can't cause I'm too busy. Um, and two, how are you going to help us survive? Oh, I am on Twitter now. <laughs> yeah, I know. Easy question. Right, Bobby? I, what? I, I am on Twitter. I hate, I, I hate Twitter. I think, I think Twitter is one of the most vile formats in the history of mankind. Seneca once said, Dan, to your point, that our descendants will be amazed at the things that we don't know that are so apparent to them. And I think in years from now, people are going to look back at Twitter, especially with its latest activity, as one of the most destructive, cruel pieces of garbage that were ever institutionalized in the history of mankind um, for a whole lot of different reasons. But I, I, I like some other plat platforms that are better, but I do use Twitter for work, but I think they're a, I think it's a vile, reprehensible place, much like Facebook, um, really evil. People go on there and they say things that they'd never say face to face, and it allows the absolute worst of humanity to be on display every single day. And, and so, and I think it's dehumanizing to people, but so people can follow Sarah on Twitter, which I don't advise, or. <laughs> I, I prefer my Facebook to all be like puppies and a lot on um, a, a kids and a lot on like Down syndrome groups. I have a lot of, um, so you're not going to really be that fascinated by following me on Facebook because it's, I mean, other than I do have, now I put my, um, my it will make you smile, though. It, it, yeah, it will make you smile or me and other people. Good. Yeah. Yeah. But Facebook, I actually and I were just starting out with this idea and I but I'm thinking about and I'm still learning it. But a, I don't know if you guys use Slack, but I'm thinking about starting a Slack with um, I, I titled it Sarah's Nerd Talk, but just a Slack where we can have like conversations about just stuff. I don't know. What do you think? The kids turned me on to this platform. I haven't used it yet, but the, the young people that, that I admire that are really bright, they, they asked me to be on this. Um, it's a conversation. It's just, it's just oral, like to your point, and it's open and you create these groups and it's called, you have to be invited. So I'll send you an invitation to get into it. You have to be invited. It's called Clubhouse. And you can create like, you can create Sarah's conversations, and people could, you could invite people to come into the conversation, and you can really control it. It's called Clubhouse, and oh, the kids okay. are using it. And you can schedule meetings, and you can do stuff. It looks really good. I haven't used it yet, but the the young people who understand this much better than I, uh, they put me into they actually put me into something that apparently I'm doing tomorrow uh, with Steve Kerber and uh, Kevin Suffin, and and uh, apparently I'm going to be there, so I'll be there. Perfect. But the, but the people that I really do trust, and I think that that it, it, it would be good. So I'd recommend that to you. Clubhouse. I'll, I'll look into that because it sounds awesome. Because it sounds like what it sounds like what um, Slack like. Because I and that's what when we were talking about like how do we have this conversation? Someone said, "What about Reddit?" And I'm like, "But it, I don't want because that's what I don't want. I don't want." And not that I don't like Reddit, but I don't want just anyone able to jump on there and just talk shit. Like, no, this is not, I don't see it as, that's not what I want. I want to have like conversations and where people say like, hey, I have a question about this or, um, so still trying to kind of figure all that. The stuff platform out. there is called MeWe and you can join that independently, MeWe. It's um, Facebook-like, except that you can control it. I have a firefighters group in there that has several hundred people. No one cusses, no one diminishes anybody else. Everyone's everyone's kind and understanding and contributing. And yeah, so but that cuts her out. You know, ooh, yeah. no cursing <laughs> at all. <laughs> Can we get a list of the like what is she grew up? What is wrong with what she grew up no. in a family of fire? <laughs> Every now and then, Bryce, I think you've kind of you know gotten your head together and then boom, dude, no, <laughs> just like that, boom. <laughs> I didn't say anything bad. I'm just, hey, Sarah said, tell us what you're thinking. And I just said, and she's not disagreeing. 
Sarah, while you're wrapping up, a couple of things. One is I think that Dan said some really cool things I'd like to elaborate on. First, the basics kind of idea keeps coming back and back. And I think the peer support group stuff that's out there is really, really good, especially the ones that have a control point, an anchor like you or Dan, uh, you know, some someone who keeps everyone aligned and, and so no one goes off the reservation and starts becoming a junior psychoanalyst. You know what I mean? Real peer support where people just say, hey, man, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what to say but I'll hug the hell out of you until you feel better. You know what I mean? Like that, that's my version of peer support, you know, and that's all I'm good at because I'm an idiot. But the other thing we mentioned Seneca earlier, that was for you, Dan, and it was Seneca the elder. That was 300 years before Jesus, by the way. And he was exactly right. The, th the third thing is um, unintended consequences, right? I, I think that leaders, and I, I want Sarah to talk to that really quickly, there's always unintended consequences. We can't foresee, Yogi Berra said it best, it's hard to predict, especially the future. And, and we can go into stuff with all but the best of intentions and have it go horribly wrong. And, and that's okay, intentions do matter. Like nowadays people are trying to tell you, oh, it's all subjective, it's just how people feel about it. No, that's not true. If, if, someone's, if someone's doing something with the best of intentions and yet through no fault of their own, they didn't recognize something or something, you know what I mean? We need to understand, and that's where I'm really pushing mercy as a, as, a, as a virtue this year, mercy. You know, I love grace, and I think grace is great, but grace is more personal. Mercy is more external, right? You show mercy. You, you live grace, right? So give, give us your thoughts real quick on how leaders navigating this incredibly fragile mental health issue can understand that a lot, sometimes it's not going to work, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes, sometimes just really awful stuff happens, despite the fact that you never, ever, ever dreamt it could. Well, so I, I mean, I think that is what they need to understand. I mean, that it's not that, and that it's never, you're never done. Like you create a peer support program, you do a behavioral health program, you have the best trainings in the world you are never done. It's, it, and that's what, I think, that's what I think departments struggle with is that they don't see, like they want a, here's how you do it. Here's what you implement. Here's the trainings you do. And it, you're just never going to be done with it. Like a great program is always bringing something new in, always that, evolving. That is so important for people to hear because I had a young friend who called me the other day and said, well, you know, I think it's time for the next generation of leaders to co come up. And I'm like, yeah, somebody tells me that every day. And they're right. It's always time for someone right. else to go. The time, the time to train on the basics is today. The time to train on the advanced is today. The time to move up is today. The time to step down is today. For someone, someplace, yeah. time, especially in an institution like the fire service where people come in, have a, have a, have a you know, connection for several years and then maybe disconnect, there's always that new group that never heard this before. Yeah. You know, there's always that Dan de Grice out there who wasn't paying attention, you know, and 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 you've got to you've got to, you know. So I always he's always, not a, he's not as good a fisherman as he was before. So you well, notice <laughs> he he didn't get the hook in. No, no, there's no, no there's no hook. That's so because my, my staff always say to me, "Well, we did an article on on hose lays, you know, last two years ago." I'm like, "Good, do it again." Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. And that's the thing is it's not, it, 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 yeah, you've got to keep, you've got to keep at it. The other thing though, that I really think, um, and I worry, and I see this as a big need with all the, the programs and stuff is that you've got to take care of the people who are taking care of the other people though. And I think I worry sometimes I hear new you know, people are trained up on the peer uh, pro, and I love, I, I'm 110% like peer approach, those trainings. Yes, 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 yes. But you also have to pay attention, like the um, like the guy that commented Todd earlier that said, you know, sometimes it can go too far. Sometimes it can, like those people who are out doing the checking in with everyone, you got to check in with them too, because there is something that's traumatizing about trying to be there for everyone, you know, make sure everyone's kind of covered. So I think that's the other thing. And then one more that I absolutely love when you start talking about the term prospective hindsight. I love that where you think ahead and think to like, what am I going to wish if this happens, what am I going to wish I had in place today? And Sarah, thinking I'm, that I'm, way. I'm the president of the center for advanced hindsight bias. 
I love it. Just say I would like. I would like to join that. Dan Ariely, actually. Dan Ariely, who's a behavioral economist, he wrote several really wonderful books, like Why We Lie All the Time, especially to ourselves. He's a brilliant, he's a, he's a Duke University's head of behavioral economics, brilliant guy, a burn survivor, burned over 90% of his body when he was a teenager in the Israeli army. And now he's the head of Duke's behavioral economics uh, department. Brilliant writer, brilliant speaker, great professor. But, but uh, Dan runs a place called the Center for Advanced Hindsight Bias. And I'm like, that's brilliant. Yes. Brilliant. Well, um, you did give us a little bit of overtime. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, that's one near the, the leader of fire engineering that, that uh, we get that allowance. Uh, I, I'm a little bit disappointed. I, I don't bet much, but I would have bet over six. Sarah, you were at three. You stayed at three. You came out of the gate strong and then you leveled out, which is remarkable, which shows that everybody's will, able, willing and able to change. Well, and it depends on, because we started the conversation with my, me saying that my mom really hated when I was cussing. So I'm like, don't even say, you know, shit. Because that was a cuss word when I was, or shut up was a cuss word when I was little. So I was, then I had like my mom think, thinking like if my mom were watching this, she'd be, so, <laughs> my mom just shakes her head. She's just like, what have I, what have I? Noticed I didn't done? use any of the guilt and shame, Bob. <laughs> Bob came in strong and hot about the guilt and shame because it, it was more applicable to him. I'm Catholic. It's our first weapon of choice. A absolutely. Yeah. As Pat Kenny would uh, share as well. But guilt is the gift yeah. just keeps on giving. I, yes. Yes, it is. We obviously, uh, it, it's kind of cool. We could have a general conversation about a tough topic that all pertains honestly to behavioral health. Uh, I, I'm really on behalf of all of us trying to survive with, or thrive. My new thing is thrive in the fire service. Look at him, he's, he's eyeballing me. I got a question that I want to ask publicly of our vaulted guest here. Oh, wait, let me finish. So uh, thrive in the, in the fire service. See, I'm a, see, I'm the lead. He's your co-host right now, Bobby. You, I don't care what your title is. Uh, thanks for taking time out, your family, your work. Uh, I still can't say your whole, the organization you work for, the center for, center. yeah, the, the, there's like 14 words. It's almost as long as this, the, the book's, titles that Bobby shares. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm in Chicago. He's in wherever he's at in a different room. But thank you, Sarah, honestly, for being here, for helping the fire service and moving forward. Um, go ahead, Bob. What do you want to say? I put it in the chat, Sarah. Did you see it? Yes, yeah, sure. Whatever you need. You can, because you couldn't make the others. That was the date change, Dan. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, FDIC is now going to be the first week of August, and Sarah can make it because you had a family conflict with, yes. the, with the other dates. So that's, yeah. that is truly why we moved the show. Um, you're saying. <laughs> so I'm sorry for everyone that's in Yeah, that's it, why we but... the show. <laughs> Remember John Lovitz, the character, the, the liar guy? Yeah. <laughs> and my wife, Morgan Fairchild. Yeah. <laughs> Don't put her on my date and time, though, please. Because well, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to you and, and let yeah. you know. So and yeah. thank you, uh, Dan. Before you guys go, I, I love you both so dearly, and I appreciate everything. And Sarah and I both share an incredible love with the community. That's just, I think, you know, everything we talked about today that we would like people to be. My brother and your son are. Uh, you know? Yes. And and. Um, what we're talking about are, are folks with uh, trisomy 21. Most people call them Down syndrome um, folks. Um, you want to see kindness. You want to see love. You want to see forgiveness. You want to see you want to see um, unconditional love. You want to see I mean just flat out joy, joy and empathy. Like if if I, if if I've got the tiniest little burn under my saddle, my kid brother Ray will go. What's wrong? And, and he won't let up until you tell him the truth. You know what I mean? Like you can tell DeGrice anything, he'll buy it. Right, like, oh, okay. Yeah, right? My kid brother, <laughs> he's got a truth detector that's unparalleled. 
I, I say it's like living with shallow hell. Like, did you ever see that movie where like they yeah. can see the real person? Yeah. And like, so I don't know what it is where like the most attractive, well-dressed person cannot get my son's eye, but the guy in the wheelchair that is, that I'm like, well, wash your hands before you, after you touch it. You know, he's like, I want to love you. And the other day, Crosswalks, my 14 year old is like in 14 year old drama. And um, she's sitting, she came and she's sitting by me and she's just bawling. And Crosby gets down from a snack and he walks over and he just hugs her and pats her back. And she's, you know, crying and he takes back and he looks at her. And it was like, he was like, you still need some more. And he just goes back in and pats her back until she calmed down. I was like, and they're so, oh. my kid brother has a favorite sister. And we all know it's Teresa. But when he smiles and hugs the other ones after they say, well, you really love Teresa, you know that it's okay yeah. because it's so honest yeah. right, that Teresa's his favorite. Yep. Sorry. Now, yeah. No, one. he's not sorry. He's like, no, he's not. He's not sorry. What it is? He's not sorry at all. <laughs> but, but it's in a great way. It's like there's nothing to be sorry awesome. about. You know, no. well, Bobby, before we jumped on and we went live, Sarah, Sarah and I had this conversation and she said, yeah, I don't know what the population is with. And, and I can't say I don't want to say Down syndrome, but it's OK. The try. Try 2021. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So like for the what the normal number of chromosomes, 46. <laughs> right. We're all screwed yeah. up because we got the 46 one. Yeah. Right. And yeah. Yeah, it we, all depends on how you look at it. <laughs> we have a because you know the school is, is always like we well, you know for a typically developing child for a typically developing child when they do all the stuff. So we actually started a um, it's just like a little, we have like you know t-shirts and stuff like that that we we sell as everything but typical for and it's about like advocacy for Down syndrome and one of our one of, one of the kiddos in the group has um, spine bifida and so but then it's like. I wanted to make this shirt because we have all these shirts for the kids that say everything but typical. And I wanted to make one for a sister that said just typical. But everyone's like, well, that's not, and I'm like, well, you know, just only 46 chromosomes. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't, you know, I, I, you know, people always say, you know, that one of the greatest speeches ever was um, Lou Gehrig when he said goodbye to the Yankees. And he said, you know, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I, I think that so many people today feel just like Lou Gehrig. And I think that, you know, I feel that way about my life. And I know Dan feels that way about his and you about yours. And, and what a tremendous blessing to be able to hang out with folks that, you know, really recognize and are grateful that we've had the greatest lives ever from the people we've met, for what we get to do, you know, for where we've been and where we're going, what a, what a ride. So thank, thanks for letting me jump in, Dan. I apologize for being late. It'll be taken out of your pay. Yeah. You uh, can have mine too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, double, we'll double Sarah's and give you more. Anyhow, um, hey, everybody that joined us, thank you for uh, Straight Talk uh, on Hump Day Hangout. Thanks to Bobby for allowing us to have this, Sarah. It's great to, to see you. I, um, so to be a topper, uh, everybody knows uh, Frank Lito, but I am your truly favorite today, I think, right? Yes. If he's okay. not watching this, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, I adore you both. All right. Thanks. Thanks for everything you do. Any, any last comments? Just say, I mean, I, I like Bobby said, I love this job i feel like i've got like the best job in the world so it's an honor to be able to work with the folks i work with and be able to connect with people like you guys and just yeah love it so thanks cool we'll see you on twitter <laughs> I'm, I'm a little disappointing on it but i'm working i'm trying to i'm not very great I, i'm not a great tweeter i know i know uh, i'm mostly well, brief it's but. the it's the the uh, yeah. See, I got, I threw the, I cast it out, and it's, it's in, it's in there. Are you trying to ruin Bobby's face? <laughs> you see, his face gets red. I mean, it just, <laughs> the blood just. Oh. Uh.
Yeah, no. Thanks, you, thanks you two for having a uh, candid conversation about Tune in next month to meet our new host. <laughs> <laughs> I hear Frank Lito is available. <laughs> Frank Lito will be leading the... Uh... Good, I was trying to figure out a way how to screw this up. <laughs> Oh, oh my God, that's amazing. See y'all. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.